welcome friends for this monthly meeting which we call a monthly satsang and the idea of having these monthly meetings or satsangs is that on the spiritual path we are fighting a very serious adversary like an enemy and that is our own mind when we have these meetings for sometimes the effect lasts on us and we feel that the spiritual path is the true purpose of life and we should get back on track on the spiritual path and later on we get involved in our daily chores in the world and we forget about it and so we need to be using some institution to remind us constantly that we should not give up the real path the real purpose of life which is the spiritual path to discover who we are what we are here for as a human being so that is why these meetings are a reminder to put us back on track and they are useful satsang the indian word for these meetings means the company of the truth sat means truth sang means company the company of the truth means wherever truth is being shared we should be there when we come to these perfect living masters and spend time with them we are really sharing the truth with them and it hits us it hits us not so much in our minds as it hits our souls it hits somewhere inside where we suddenly realize that is the truth we are hearing that's the truth we are looking for that the truth we were always looking for that feeling that comes in the presence of these people whom we call perfect living masters is a very powerful feeling and sustains our progress on the spiritual path and that is why if we cannot be in the presence of these rare people and they are rare these perfect living masters but we gather amongst ourselves and think of those people and think of the truth and talk about the truth that is also as good as satsang so these meetings are good whether you are able to attend the meeting of the perfect living master or attend meetings with people who are following this path it's a useful trigger for remembering that our true purpose of life is this one why do we call the spiritual path as the true purpose of life i must have received thousands of emails in the last several years asking what is the purpose of life and i say the purpose of life is to find who you are why you are here what's the purpose of having experiences of the physical world and that's the main purpose of being a human being it is not necessary to be a human being to be a living being you can be a plant you can be an insect you can be a bird you can be an animal you can be an angel you can be a ruling god of one of the higher regions of, of consciousness none of those beings have the power to find out who they are and the only one single dot species of human life or of any life is the human life in which we can seek our own self and seek the purpose of our life why are we here why did we come into this world at all we didn't come to have suffering and all did we have a hand in coming here what is forced upon us what is the truth what is the reality have you ever known that how is there so much discrimination in this world people are born poor and sick and some are born rich and healthy how can there be so much discrimination from person to person if a religion says we are all children of god it doesn't make sense at all that there should be so much discrimination in a creator who should create such different varieties of people and put them at such differential with each other then what is this show about why is it happening like this if we can find the truth about our own self we'll get answers to all these questions one simple step of discovering who you really are answers all these questions to your own satisfaction i will test it out and what is that answer the answer is that the creator whom we are placing somewhere outside and thinking he lives in heaven or somewhere is actually inside us he is our own reality he is the truth inside us he is the only truth inside us 
all rest has been created for an experience for the true self. And these experiences have been created with a very good purpose. These experiences have been created by the power of that one truth for which we have no name. And we have used many names. I use a certain term for it, which is, as I feel guilty that I am not expressing myself what I want to say. I call it totality of consciousness. I say where all consciousness becomes one. That creative power, I think, would be described as the self. Not a good definition, but I don't find anything better. Therefore, when we find that our reality, our truth, who we are, is actually inside us and is manifesting through all these experiences outside, it's consciousness experiencing what consciousness becomes conscious of, which we call creation. And this is all happening from inside out, not the other way around. There is no creator sitting outside doing it. It's happening from inside. We go to sleep and have a dream and see a whole new world of dream world and we think it's all outside. We wake up and discover it's our own creation. Supposing you could wake up repeatedly from even this dream which we call physical reality, what would happen? You discovered that we are the ultimate dreamer and there's only one. Only one dreamer. You can call him the creator, you can call him my God, you can call him by any name, you can call him the totality of consciousness. There's only one dreamer who sets up series of dreams. Why? In order to have a series of different experiences that are possible with consciousness. The experiments that can be done with consciousness are so immense, so infinite. And why not experiment? And then place in those experiences one experience which should enable you to wake up when you like and come back to the single dreamer. So all these experiences are different life forms, different levels of creation, different levels of consciousness that have been provided to us. They create different experiences for us because that is what consciousness is conscious about. It's a simultaneous experience that consciousness becomes conscious of something, experiences at the same time become reality for us. That's how we talk this. It doesn't look like it when we identify ourselves with one of the characters in a play we create. If we ourselves were knowledgeable enough to know that we are not characters, we created the characters in our dream, in our play, in our show. If we can become truly knowledgeable, not conscious of it, knowledgeable about it, then you will see that the creative power has been placed in one of the characters at all times, at every level of consciousness. It has never been left out somewhere. The creative power, or God, or any name you give, Allah, Ishwar, Parmeshwar, any name you give, lies inside every form that has ever been created. And from their experiences, everything that is created outside. It doesn't matter if it's a human being, or it's an animal, or it's an angel, or it's a god, or any, any, any other power at any other level. So this secret, that the creative power is always inside, and the creation is created outward, is a great knowledge to get. Not from reading books, not theoretically, but from experience. <coughs> personal experience. Personal experience of going within, finding the real secret of this creation, from within. And that is the purpose of this life, that this human life has been made singularly different from all other life forms because it provides a chance for us to wake up from the dream. It provides a chance for us to shed these outer covers that are created by dreams for different experiences and find the inside core of our true being. These covers outside create a character for us. No, no matter what cover we put on, every character that we find in this world, including ourselves, we become a character of the very kind of creation we create. No different. Supposing you are in a physical reality and have a physical body. The physical reality outside is your only reality and you are assuming that you are the self as a physical being because you are functioning 
inside through the physical being, not realizing that the physical being that you think you are is merely one of the characters like all other characters. It does not make you different. What makes you different is that you are experiencing all others only by yourself, not through anybody else. You are always experiencing through the same self. Then you go to sleep, have a dream, you move around, do you know it's the same self that went to sleep? Not somebody else. You are not creating another character that runs around. You run around. Supposing you take a different form and become different in a dream, you still know that's you. The same you that went to sleep. When you wake up, you know that was you. A Chinese philosopher once said that he had a dream that he was a butterfly. And he was roaming around in a garden full of illuminated flowers which were so full with light and color that he was very impressed. He said this must be the true real, real place, it's a reality, it was more real than the physical world. But he was a butterfly. He went from flower to flower. They were so extraordinary, live flowers with lights coming from them, which he had never seen in the physical world. And then he woke up and he found he was a human being as a philosopher. He contemplated, am I really a butterfly and now dreaming that I am a human being? Or am I a human being who had a dream that I am a butterfly? He told his friends that he had this strange dream in which he was a butterfly and that looked more real than the physical world. His friend said, don't be stupid, you are a human being, you can't be a butterfly. You shouldn't say, I was a butterfly, you should say, you saw a butterfly in your dream. I was flying as a butterfly. There was no distinction between this I and that I, the self was still the same. And then he said, how did you know it was you if you were a butterfly? He said, because I was flying, I woke up, I knew I was flying as a butterfly. The self never changes. The true self, which is our reality, never changes, no matter what experiences we have at any level of consciousness. That's remarkable. It should be a good indication to us that if we have to find the self, we should find it in whatever form we are. It will be within ourselves. That is why all these great mystics who got their eyes open to higher levels of consciousness said, go within. The real kingdom is within you. The real nature of God is within you. The real essence is within you. And you have to find it within us. The human being is a unique form of life because it has been given a very unique experience that no other form of life has. And that experience we call free will. We feel that we can make our own decisions. We feel that we decide what to do. We can make choices. That there are always alternatives in front of us and we make a choice. Our whole life is built up on making choices. It is a unique experience. No other form of life has it. They just go by their instinct, they go by their programs, they go by their mental programs and their DNA programs run their lives. And we on the other hand, with similar DNA, almost identical DNA with a monkey, almost the, half the DNA of a human being is the same as a banana. You can imagine, the DNA is running our lives the same as theirs. Then what's the difference? The difference is their DNA runs their life, they don't think what they have to decide. And we think we have to decide what to do. Maybe it's a big illusion. Maybe it's the greatest illusion that we have real free will. But an experience is real. Experience is so real when a person says, I have no free will. He has used his free will right there to say that. He could have said, I have free will or I don't have free will. This concept that free will is not real does not apply to the human physical state in a physical world. We make choices. We are forced to make choices. There is no option for that. Then, is it truly real? We will find out. But you can't find out when you are in a physical form. In physical form, it will always be real. Now, what is the advantage of having this kind of an experience unique to a human being of free will? The advantage is you can seek to find your own self. You can't do that in any other form. You can be a seeker. No other form of life can be a seeker except a human being. And that's why it's the greatest gift to us to be a human being. 
people say, we want to see miracles. The miracle is you are a human being. The greatest miracle. There you can find yourself. It's the best miracle that has ever happened. As a human being, we seek. And if you seek, you will find. Period. Seek and you will find. If you seek, where would you seek? It depends what you are seeking. If you are seeking your sex partners, your friends outside, you will find outside. If you seek wealth, you will find outside. If you seek material thing, you will find outside. But what if you want to seek yourself? You will find inside yourself, not outside. So seeking within is a secret available only to human beings. And that's such an important thing. When you will seek within, you will discover that this body of yours, which you are thinking is your own self, was merely yourself in a costume designed to create a physical experience because you are wearing a physical costume. It's not real. It's made up by consciousness in the same way as everything else is made up by that ultimate consciousness. And you are able to use this physical body to have the experience of a physical world, including the experience of seeking in a physical world and finding the truth beyond physical. The most amazing thing that you can use this physical body to discover the truth that is lying inside, which is not physical at all. How do we do it? It appears there are other forms of life also which are not physical. We get information, slight information about that. Then we go to sleep and see if we can create a dream world which is not physical. We wake up and that disappears. There are people who say they can wake up from this level and have another level of an astral travel and travel in a world which is not physical. Their testimony is there. Can we also do it? People say they have near-death experiences where they find their body floating above the physical body. They see, have experiences when physical body is not there. The testimony is there. Can we try it? We don't have to try. We all die in the physical body. We find out ourselves. Everyone dies. Nobody is immortal in the physical world. Nothing is immortal in the physical world. I saw a documentary the other day in which they said if there was no human being on this planet, in the physical planet of the earth, what would happen? They said by next year, things will start crumbling down. They will not be taken care of. After 100 years, this will be changing. After a million years, all the big monuments will have gone down. After 20 million years, 100 million years, everything will be reduced to dust. All animals will die, all human beings will die, everything will die. Except a few shrub will be left. It goes steadily telling what the impact of a human being is on the planet. And we think that the planet was made up by human beings and can die also without human beings. This human being as a character on the physical world creates everything around. And when you discover from this testimony that death is not really death of the inside self, it's only death of a person of the body here, it's a very great experience. But dying and then not being able to tell anybody else is no use. It's not of any value to us. A person has died and he's shouting in his, in his disembodied spirit. We are not dead. We are alive. We can't hear him. We can't see him. We sometimes feel his presence. Some people say, my dear you know, mother, she was so good, but now she's haunting me like a ghost. The same person who was so dear has become like a ghost because not the body is not there. But the presence is there. But we don't have any solid evidence. What happens after death? Can we, while alive, check out what happens to us when we die physically? Yes, it is possible. And that is the secret that these mystics and saints and enlightened saints have shared with us. That you can die while living and tell the story from your own experience. Not necessarily to others, at least to yourself. You can tell the story that death does not mean death for you, it means death for the body. How do you die while living? In the Gospels, Paul says, I die daily. It doesn't mean that he's physically dying. It means experiencing death every day. Anybody can do it. It's not a rare event. If you want to do it, you can do it. And what's the secret of doing it is? 
to pretend you are dead. One of the greatest Maharishis, a great saint in India, Raman Maharishi, discovered the truth when he was very sick and physically dying and he only one servant who was attending on him. He left for an errand and he was calling him and the servant wasn't there. And Raman was frightened that I am going to die and nobody is around me. Then he said, after all, what will be death? And he pretended to die. He stretched his he stressed his arms and his legs, created an artificial rigor mortis that this is what will happen. And everything he tried to imitate, my breathing will stop. Then he said, but who am I talking then? I am talking more cleverly now and more carefully now, more loudly now than I was doing when I was, I was not dead. By pretending to be dead, I found out I don't die. And from there is started the research about death became an enlightened person later on. If we can pretend to be dead, full pretense, it can work. But to pretend to be dead, to simulate all the elements of death is not easy. Therefore, as a practice of dying while living, these mystics have given us, these saints have given us a very good formula. They have said that death does not take place simultaneously all over the body. Death creeps upon you from the extremities upwards, goes to the torso, ultimately goes into the brain. If the brain is dead, then you are dead. Till then, you can lose the consciousness and sensation of your extremities, of your body, of your torso, feel you are floating in the air, and still you are there. Only when the brain dies, when the head where you are operating from, when that dies, where consciousness operates from, then you are dead. So, Mystics have suggested what is making us alive is our awareness that we have a body, our awareness that we have hands and feet and our body, our awareness that we have eyes to see, our awareness that we have ears to hear. And through these awarenesses, we are aware there is another world outside, a physical world, which we are accessing now. What if we withdraw this awareness? If we withdraw this awareness, would we be able to come back to the same point? where death takes us. Now, how does withdrawal of awareness take place? They examine further what is creating the awareness. The awareness is being created by the power of a small probe in awareness called attention. When we put attention on something, we create it. At least we create the experience of it. And that is why our attention is flowing from the head right all through the body creating the experience and feeling of a body. And from the body and its sense perceptions, we are having experience of an outside world. What if I close my eyes and close my ears? Don't want to listen to what's happening outside. Don't want to see what's happening outside. And then I want to close my limbs also so that I only work in the head. Is it possible? Yes. If attention is creating all these experiences, we can work with withdrawing our attention. Attention can be put anywhere you like. When we read a book, we put our attention on the book and read it. We are not conscious of what is happening around us. Very little attention is outside to become aware of there is some surrounding around us, a permanent physical world around us. But the attention is on the book which we are reading. We can put attention on a flower and watch it. We can put attention on a person and forget. We can go to a concert and Watch your different musical instruments playing. Put attention on the drums, they become louder, others become less. They don't change there. <coughs> Our attention has picked up something and made us unaware of the rest. This principle is the secret of discovering yourself. This principle of using attention properly is the secret of discovering yourself. Instead of putting attention on things outside, on the body, Put your attention from where the attention is originating, right in the brain, in the head. Now you can localize it even more. You can even pinpoint where that point is from where attention is flowing. It's right in the center of the head, the most well protected part of the whole human body. Right where the pineal gland is, right where the pituitary body hangs, the medulla oblongata. If I talk to you about the anatomy of the head, it's exactly in the middle behind the eyes, in the center. That's where we are conscious from. 
that's where we arrive from, that's where our sensations come from, that's where thoughts come from, that's where the mind functions, that's where everything functions, and that's how we know there's a physical world outside. If we can put our attention there, what will happen? The longer you can hold the attention there, the more unaware you'll become of your surroundings. Same principle. The longer you can hold your attention there, the more you will become unaware of your own body, starting from the limbs, starting from the hands and feet, and withdrawing and going through the whole torso. And one day, if you hold the attention there, you will not even know you have a body. I am not talking of an out-of-body experience. I am talking of withdrawing your attention to your own self and, re and awakening to a new level. Not that this body is there and you are now using a heart chakra or some energy centers to go and experience something separate from it and linked with a silver cord to this body. I am not talking of those experiences. I am talking of awakening to a different yourself by becoming unconscious, unaware of the physical body. Anybody can do it. It is not a very special technique. We all use attention. A five-year-old child is using attention and a hundred-year-old man is also using attention. So meditation, in order to discover yourself, is possible for anybody from 5 years old to 100 years old. Irrespective of nationality, color of the skin, irrespective of gender, sex, anything. It doesn't matter who you are. It is open to you. It is the greatest gift given to us. It is the greatest gift to be able to use your attention, to withdraw to your own self and awaken to a higher reality of your own self and discover that what you thought was your real self with the physical body was merely a sensation created by yourself, created by consciousness in order to have a physical experience in a physical world. It's totally opposite of the belief that the physical world is real and we've just come for a little time here. A belief that is ingrained in us. A belief that is very necessary for us to make this real. To create an experience as a real experience which is the purpose of having experience, to make it a real experience, it is necessary for us to believe that this is a real world and this is the only real world. Nothing else is real. All others is just imaginary. This is the only physical real world. We have to operate here. It's, it's true that at, at the physical level, we believe this is the only reality. It is the only reality. Period. We have no other reality. But if you put your attention within yourself and awaken, you find a new reality. This becomes a dream. Just like when you are dreaming in the, in the physical world, in a sleep state, that dream is a reality. You are not aware of the physical world. The dream world is the physical world for you at that time. And here, you wake up, that disappears. Becomes a dream, and the wakeful physical world becomes real. At one time, we have only one reality. We did not create illusions. It's only the process of consciousness using what we might call illusion to create reality. The consciousness did not create illusions. If somebody says this world is illusion, I don't agree. It's real. If, if it's illusion, don't eat food and don't, tell me if you won't starve. Don't talk to me because I am not real. No, he's trying to convince me. It's illusion. It's illusion. Am I not illusion? Why are you talking to me then? Why are you talking to shadow? This is the only reality. It's real. So long as we are in the physical plane. So long as we are creating a physical world. The physical world is the only reality. If it were not the only reality, how would mystic come into our life here and tell us what real? We hear them, we listen to them because this is real. The mist, then the mystics are also not real. Nobody is real then. No, this is the process of illusion. The method of consciousness becoming conscious could be called a process of using illusion. The process cannot be confused with the end product. The, con the process of using illusion by consciousness creating something that is not materially real and yet giving the experience of material reality is a process being used to create reality for us. So that is why it becomes important to accept this reality. And we are working to discover ourselves in this reality. We are not working somewhere else. We are trying to use this physical body to discover a reality after which we will find out that the physical body was not real when we wake up to our level. 
So that is why it's important to know that this system of meditation that these mystics tell us is a system to be used in the physical body, in this reality which we accept. But once you use the system, you can find the true reality which is beyond this physical reality. Now once you are able to do that and become unaware of the physical body altogether, what happens? We don't disappear. We are more alive than here. We become like the butterfly that the Chinese philosopher saw. Everything gets bright and lit up. Flowers are shining with light. The whole world is shining with light. It's a strange world where the sun never sets. It's a strange world where we have no weight. It's a strange world where we have no physical bodies. But it's a great world. It's a world that exists contemporarily, simultaneously with this one. We never saw it. Because we were blinded into physical reality by putting our attention out into a physical form through which we operated in this world. These forms are created. And somebody comes to me and says, are you suggesting that I am creating this world? No, I am not suggesting that you, the physical body, are creating this world. You can't even change anything here. Try. If you are making it up, try to change the color of these flowers. You can't do anything. But you, the self, are creating this world. And the body is not the self. Discover who you are. You are creating everything. You are the creator. If you discover yourself. If you don't discover yourself. And think that the cover upon you. The costume for a particular experience. Is yourself. You are powerless. You have no power to create anything. You can create something with your intellect. You can create material things in a material world. You can create astral things in an astral world. You can create all the karma of the world in a causal state. You can create everything, change the whole destiny of people in a state above the causal state, in the men, above the supramental state. You can do all the things, but only in those states. Not when you're sitting in the physical body here. So that is why the possibility of discovering all levels of creation, all levels of consciousness, lies in the human body when we're sitting here. It's amazing. It's the most amazing experience. The most amazing miracle that one can have. And the process continuously is the same. Go within. Go within this body. You discover the higher self. Go within that body. Discover the still higher self. The mind. Just go within the mind. The mind becomes a costume. Throw it out. You become the living force of consciousness. This is your soul. You go within the soul. You discover there was only one total soul. The creator of everything. People cannot even understand what it means to find our true self. I have not seen it written in any book, by the way. I haven't read many books, but whatever I have seen, they talk like you are going back to your true home and leaving everything behind. When you wake up from a dream, do you leave everything behind and then wake up or do you finish the whole dream? Everything is gone with, with you. When you wake up from a dream, the whole dream ends. All the people you saw, all the places you saw, all the buildings you saw, all the worlds you saw, all the galaxies you saw, they disappear when you wake up. When we go to our true home, and this is not mentioned anywhere that I know of, but I want to share the experience with you. When you go to your true home, you draw the core of creation with you into it. Not that you're going as a single person traveling into a place where everybody else is around. The ultimate experience, if there is only one, how can anything be outside of it? You draw everything with you. That's the greatest of experience of merger that you can even think of or contemplate it at any level. We talk of a merger, which I think is a great thing to be merging into reality. But the ultimate merger is a merger of entire creation at all levels with you going into your true home. So these things are not described anywhere because I don't think they can be described. It's impossible to describe them. We are taking our division into separation and reality. We are different beings. We look so different. We, are, we talk differently. We think differently. Our languages are different. Everything is different. We wear different clothes. How can we be one? In the ultimate, not only we are one, there is no we. There is only one. The one creating the we. The one creating the experience of the we. Not creating we. Creating the experience of the being, creating the experience of the self, of the many, experience of 
they are being separated separate. there is a great art i think our creative power the ultimate creator is the greatest artist i have not seen any art better than the art of creation that has taken place the artist only one artist chooses to make the many of the same type consciousness splitting into multiple consciousness like a person looking into a mirror sees his own image there then he puts a thousand mirrors sees thousand images there puts one mirror with all the little little uh, round images and sees thousand images in one the creation of an image of oneself in a thousand million trillion unlimited infinite forms no mirrors was there a compulsion on consciousness to do that no there was no compulsion is total freedom if there is only one consciousness consciousness cannot be tied down to anything the totally free if we can call something totally free it would be a totality of consciousness totally free then what was the need if mentally we want to ask this question which won't apply here but i have just using it as an example here if we were to ask the question why did one totality of consciousness one creative power one creator decide to create the many if we go back on the spiritual track discovering each level from bottom up from the physical to the sensory to the mental to the spiritual to the total if we go in that order we discover the reasons for each level being created as we see them and then we reach the top we discover that there is something that persists at every level something that's persisting even now even in dreams and at every level not everything persists for example separation doesn't persist there these flowers won't persist even the astral plane they'll become astral flowers in the causal plane they'll just become a concept of flowers not even flowers in the spiritual states they'll just become a creative power which can create flowers and other things it won't be these flowers but there is one thing that's going flowing through all the time I and mean, maybe more than one thing which does not leave us at any time and those three things i am going to mention are available to us at all times even the physical body even the dream body even the astral body even causal body even in our totality what are those three things first is called love the power of love exists everywhere is the most powerful thing is almost the identity of our totality love they say god is love love is god they didn't say it in vain they didn't just make a statement because love is right there to the top and descends right to up to this point and never leaves us the principles of attachment and so on are based upon the principle of love there are so many other things that are happening here which are holding us here but the principle by which they were created for the power of love second the power of bliss the power to have ult- ultimate happiness not pleasure happiness that blissful state the state of appreciating and feeling glad about it persist at all levels the beauty the creation of beauty and the appreciation of beauty persists all over and an instant knowledge without thoughts persists everywhere here we call it intuition we call it gut feeling we give different names to it but it persists in every level so amazing thing is that in our essence in our ultimate essence there we are merely the creative power these three things can still be found there love beauty and its appreciation and the instant knowledge which we call intuition if this is the nature essence of our ultimate being and naturally it has to be expressed the whole of the creation is based upon that principle all levels have been created based upon that principle and when you talk of love how do you experience love the best way to experience love as our greatest intelligence of the totality of consciousness experienced or created was having more than one the great very essence of the principle of creating the many creating the many one became the many to experience his essence of love 
and love was unbounded in that experience. And we call it our true home. That's where we belong. Those individuated forms of consciousness, which are part of unconsciousness, but within the unconsciousness, they're experiencing that individuation as ourselves. There's our true self. You can from there discover one or you can discover the many. They're both simultaneous together in our true home. The principle of going within by meditation can take you to that level. Of course, it requires a lot of steps to go through. But you can go through the steps. First step I just mentioned to you is to experience dying while living. And that will put you into a state of being where you have a much longer life. You will recall past lives in physical bodies. You will recall your past lives in non-physical bodies. That's first step. Second step, and the first step also shows that the sense perceptions which you are using in the physical body are not belonging to the physical body. If the sense perceptions of seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, these perceptions which are creating the whole physical world for us, we do not know the physical world except through these senses. The senses create this physical world. These do not belong to the physical body. They belong to the body which you discover when you die either by natural death or by meditative meditation and withdrawing attention to the self. Sense perceptions are actually the astral body. You know, body, the sense perceptions function like a body like this one. But the sense perceptions are very strong, very powerful in that form. And so you can see, touch, taste, smell, everything without a physical body. That's why you are so light. That's why there is no gravity. That's why there is no power to hold you down. And that experience is available to you by drawing attention to the point behind the eyes, which we now call third eye center. Because these two eyes don't actually see. We think the two eyes are designed to see. The two eyes are designed to create images. The two eyes don't create the same image. They create two different images. We combine the two images and see the stereoscopic distance and, the, and this effect, that stereoscopic effect of seeing distance is created because the two eyes see two different pictures. We can go to a 3D movie today and see that we can wear artificial glasses and create a 3D image. These two eyes are seeing two different pictures because of their distance. Where do they combine to create the distance? Have you ever noticed that when you're looking at something, in the physical body, with physical eyes, where are you looking from a single image? If you are looking at the eyes, through the eyes, you would see two images. Where do you combine and where does it become a single image? Where do you see it from? You see it, and that's an actual experience we are all having. Nobody saying, I am seeing with the eyes only, I am seeing combined image from behind the eyes at this common place, where it crosses like this in the center. We always see like that. Therefore, that seat itself is the third eye center. That itself is the place from where consciousness is operating in a physical body. Not difficult to know. When you close your eyes and you want to know where you are, where you're thinking from, where do you believe you are, that's where you are. People say we are searching very hard in our meditation for third eye center. It's not hard at all. You know where you are. Don't think the body is you. Just forget that part. Say you are in the head, sitting in the head. Where are you? Don't assume you are a body you are looking for or something that you are looking for. Just say, I know where I am and you will be at the third eye center. And that's where you put your attention on. When you do that, the sense perceptions are sustained and never die. At least not for a long time. The average length for those who have gone into that level and seen the average length of life for the sense perceptions is much more than the physical body, ranging from 1,000 to 3,000 physical years. Do you know we have been using our sense perceptions, the same sense perceptions in past lives, we use the same sense perception next life. And that's why the perceptions persist. Of course, the eyes are very clear, 20-20 vision, maybe better. The hearing is great. No hearing aids required even for old age, not even at 3,000 years old astral body.
But when you withdraw your attention within that body, behind the eyes of the astral self, which is which is a little different from the withdrawal of attention from the physical body, but under the guidance of a trained person, you can go to that level, you will notice that you are becoming unaware of your sense perceptions. You don't feel you have eyes to see, you don't feel you have got ears to hear, they disappear. And what comes up is a total mental grasp of everything, total mental picture in one picture, everything, the hearing and hearing and seeing become the same. All sense perceptions become the same. Because when the mind takes over, what the sense perceptions are doing. To discover that you have a mind that functions independently, the same mind that you are using for thinking today, it's not a different mind. The mind you use for thinking today becomes yourself. And therefore, that mental state, which we call causal state, is a very great experience. But there you find that these things which we thought were all separated creation were coming from a single source, the mind. The mind itself, which we are using for thinking, is the causal body. It's not a body. We just assume that all bodies are just like this. They are not. The mind is the causal body. And the concepts that are created by the mind work to create the ideas of things and make pictures of particular things in the astral plane. And those ideas create all the physical world that we see here. Even operating as human beings, we are using all those facilities from inside to get the concept, to get the idea, and to make uh, something. Socrates, through Plato, explains this idea, the Greek philosopher, very beautifully. He says, and he, this is a conversation with Aristotle. Plato talking to Aristotle. Plato is uh, learning from Socrates that the world of ideas is more real than the physical world. And Aristotle question, is not true. Ideas are in the mind. And this is just a physical world in the air. How can you say that that is more real? So then he explains, he was sitting on a chair. The chair wouldn't have been there if there wasn't an idea of a chair. Where did the idea of a chair originate? Go back to that. You will discover to somebody's imagination, somebody's astral thinking, not self perceptions, somebody thinking inside and came up with an idea that we could have something to sit higher than the ground. And the idea of a chair came up. A chair came up. Today we have millions of different kinds of chairs. But they all came from the single idea. One idea of a chair created all the chairs. If that idea was not there, no chair would be here. But where did the idea of chair come from? The concept that we sit. The concept we sit, yeah or no. Where did the concept come from? From a still higher plane, our own mind. The mind created the concept. The sensory perceptions created what could be seen in the chair and all the physical chairs came from there. Everything that we are ex experiencing here is coming in these stages. The mind is the causal body and we discover the truth about our destinies, we discover how destinies are made. And so on, we go to our ultimate self and find that consciousness is the ultimate creator of everything and we find a unique individuated consciousness, which is our soul, which is our reality, which never is born, never dies. Mind even has a life, maybe about 3 billion physical years, a little more or less. But soul is immortal. It was always there, will always be there. That's our reality. We go higher to totality, of course that is total. All souls are part of it. And never separated, only having a separate experience of the many. What a beautiful setup. How can you say there can be greater artists than this who designed this, who set up all this? And who is that artist? We, in our true form, in our ultimate reality. And that's the same artist, the same creative power manifesting in so many right here and right everywhere else in the universe experiencing its own creation. It's the creator experiencing its own creation through several points of view which we are as human beings. This is points of view of a single creation, creator, experiencing creation. All this that I am sharing with you can be verified by you. It is not a theoretical model I am setting up for you. I am not saying, believe me. 
I am saying see it for yourself. Practice, go with it. Methods are available. You can use them. Do your best. Now, what was the purpose of creating a world like ours with so much misery, unhappiness, torture, terror, sadness, sickness? Is there any purpose for consciousness to experience these? What's the very purpose of creating all this unhappiness and such misery? Couldn't you have a better design than that? The truth is that consciousness, when confined to form and space and time, which happens at the causal level, at the mental level, cannot experience anything except in pairs of opposites. If you want to experience happiness in these words, three words of space and time, you can only experience if you know what is unhappiness. It won't be a concept happiness. The concept of happiness comes from unhappiness. The concept of light comes from darkness. Think of it, if there is light all the time around us, whether we close our eyes, open our eyes, whether we are day, evening, morning, you never have seen light. You wouldn't even know about it. You wouldn't even know it exists. Therefore, in these three worlds, the experience was generated by pairs of opposites. It's a world of duality. And therefore, the dual world was created so we could have all the experiences. But was it necessary for the ultimate reality to do that? Yes, because the ultimate reality, where there is no duality, creates a world of duality and makes it a dual world. That's the greatest miracle. I can't imagine anything more soundly set than this creation. And everything that is set here. But then you say, is it good to give real pain to the self to have this? No. If you wake up, there is no real pain. Supposing you have an accident in a dream and are injured in a dream. Say, oh, wow, powerful injured accident. I am so much in pain. You wake up. Thank God it was a dream. That's what we will say. Every time you wake up to a higher level, you will realize it was like a dream. We did not ca cause real pain. We caused experience of pain, which became unreal when we woke up. And therefore, we created an illusion of the pairs of opposites to rise one day whenever we like. And when I say whenever we like, I want to explain that also. If we were individuated consciousness, souls, in our true home, and we decided to have the experiences, first of all, it's not necessary that the entire myriads of those souls should come and have an experience. Only select few decided, we are those select few. Decided to come and have new experiences. We descended to different levels and having experiences, we came right up to here with the arrangement made right from day one, right at inception, that when we are tired of this experience, we will go back and awake. And we did not want to just leave it to chance how will we wake up? I, I remember a movie somebody recommended to me. I don't normally go see movies called Inception. Many of you might have seen it. Inception is also a movie which I like because it creates realities through dreams. But in order to wake up from a horrible dream, they carry a totem in their hand, which comes up in the dream also. It's a little pricky thing in the hand, in the palm. So when they press that, they can wake up. So they made the arrangement before going to sleep in that movie to be able to wake up when they want to. We made the same arrangement. Before we came ever left our true home, we made the arrangement when we are tired of the show we are creating. When we are tired of the world of duality, we should be able to wake up. And the, and the totem was the seeking and finding of something in that universe called a perfect living master. Perfect living master is part of our illusion, part of our creation. And yet, he appears in our life when we are ready to go home. It's our own decision. We have made an arrangement ourselves that when we are tired of this world of duality, world of opposites, we can wake up. And we made the arrangements and that seeking comes at the right time when we want to wake up. When the seeking comes, 
perfectly like master appears in our life. We don't find it. You can't find it. There's no way you can find it. He can draw you to him through the same power that exists in totality, power of love. That's the method. These mystics don't use other methods. Even meditation is for our mind. For our body, senses and our mind. It's not required by our soul. Our soul only requires love. Love pulls us and we can't help it. We go back home. That's the method they use. That is why we are drawn by a strange love when we meet these people. And we can't even explain. Sometimes the mind want makes us run away. We don't want to believe in these people. And the love pulls us back. This is a strange thing, but it's the method we have set up ourselves. So, it's a very guided thing that we have arranged ourselves. And that is why, when we are ready to go home, the master appears by coincidence, by strange methods. Any method can be used, it's a degraded method. In India, they say, when a chela is ready, the guru appears. They don't say, when a chela is ready, you can find a guru. He appears. And that is how these happen. If you ask these people when you go to perfect living masters, how all those people sitting around have found him, they tell each one will tell a different story of the coincidences through which they came up. The circumstances were made possible for them to come up here. People picked up from different parts of the created universe, all coming at the right time when they're ready to go back home. So when you're ready, master appears, and that's the method we ourselves built. What does he say? He acts exactly like ourselves, like an ordinary person. There was a very holy saint in India. His name was Baba Fakir Chak. I'm mentioning his name to you because I get a lot of emails about him, asking me questions about what he said. He says, a perfect living master is like an ordinary human being. He knows nothing. When he acts as a perfect living master, your power inside you is acting. Now, many people have misunderstood this. He was our neighbor. I knew him. My father was a good friend of his. We lived in the same town, Musharpur, in India. And so, being his neighbor, I also attended his satsangs. In one of the satsangs, he's telling his own story that when he was in the war, First World War, he was in the base post office or somewhere, and the other people were in an advanced stage. Three Soldiers who were his disciples were all ambushed by the enemy and they knew they were going to die. So they all sat together to pray to him to save them if they can or be ready to take them, take them home if their time has come to die. As they sat meditating, he appeared in front of them. All three of them saw him and he said, you are not going to die. Go behind this camp and there's the bushes there. Under that there's a tunnel. Come out of the tunnel behind the enemy lines. And they did that. They found the bush, they went and came back and went straight to him to thank him. Thank him for saving their life. He said, I know nothing about it. So Kishan says, I know nothing. I myself sitting frightened. Some ball may fall on me. And on that basis there, there's a book called The Unknowing Saint. It's a biography of the unknowing saint. He said, I know nothing. Now, people have started believing that really all saints know nothing. Because Fakir Chand is, they, in one article I read, Fakir Chand is the only honest, honest mystic, honest saint, who declared we know nothing. Now, do they really know nothing? Are they showing humility? Or is he telling the truth? People have not heard his satsangs when he describes his, dis his statement. I have heard the satsang. In that he explains, that when we say we know something, the knowledge is not coming from the physical body. The knowledge is not coming even from the mind. Knowledge is coming from our truth, which is only one. Therefore, when somebody says, you are doing for each other something, I say, no. That power is doing, which is also in you, also in me. He explained that. And in one sense, I'm very interesting. Fakichan is telling the same story to his people, I know nothing. And his disciple, who became a saint in his lifetime, his name is Tarachan, son Tarachan. Son Tarachan is also sitting there. After Fakir Chand has said, I know nothing, he asked son Tarachan, you also give a satsang. So Tarachan takes the microphone. He says, don't believe this guy. <laughs> He's telling his master. 
He says, I have come from a thousand miles away to see him. If he knew nothing, I would not make that trip. <laughs> I have come here. I want to explain to you why he's saying that. He is making a very important point. He is making a point that all true knowledge is coming from one source. And that source is in you and me and everybody. Therefore, he is taking no credit for the physical form of Fugirchan to say that he has the knowledge and nobody else has. Everybody has the same knowledge. Everybody has the same source. All human beings have the same source. Actually, all creation is the same source. The source is one. And just because one person has been arranged by us, by that source, to become a perfect living master, that person must behave and must act like anybody else at that level. That is why when we meet these perfect living masters, they are just like us. They live like us. They, their whole life is like us. They are born like us. They die like us. And they live like us. They fall sick like us. They take medicines like us. They get treatment like us. No difference. What is the difference then? The difference is they are aware of their totality of consciousness, which they know is in all of us. And there is no difference. Each one of us is the same. It's not a, any discrimination has been done. The discrimination was created for the power of duality to be experienced in non-duality. There is the truth is non-dual, and we can appreciate it a lot more by seeing the opposite of it. That's why this world was created in opposites. This is a beautiful experience. I'm sharing with you because I don't want to make it a book knowledge, radical models of this thing. This is personal experience, personally experienceable by everybody. My suggestion to you would be, listen to everybody, but don't believe it till you experience. Don't even believe me. It's not something based on belief, because that would be blind belief. Blind faith has no place in true spirituality. True spirituality is to discover your spirit, yourself, not what somebody else is saying. It does not mean that unless you see spectacles inside, you are not spiritual. Your life changes, outside things happen. In this very physical reality you are experiencing as reality, miracles happen in this reality. You are progressing spiritually. So many things are happening in our life once we are on the spiritual path. Life changes right here. Don't wait for something to come later. Watch now. If you are on a spiritual path, doing this meditation, outside life will change at the same time as inside life. So don't wait for something. Oh, I see nothing, therefore I am not spiritual. I have made no progress. You are making progress. The moment your love and devotion is increasing, which is the pull that is going to take you back home. The mind can go only up to the causal plane, up to the mental level. It cannot go beyond thinking and mental calculation. Intellectual calculation cannot take you beyond the mind. The only thing that will take you beyond the mind into true reality is love and devotion. Start from here. Practice your meditation with love and devotion. You have been given the instrument of practicing by a perfect living master who comes into your life. His love is unconditional. One of the definitions of a perfect living master is you experience his love is unconditional, non-judgmental. He will never judge you how good or bad you are. He picks you up because you are marked soul, ready to go. You are ready. Therefore, he has come. He not come to evaluate your karma. Your own mind is doing that evaluation all the time. He doesn't need to get into that. Therefore, you fall in love with that person. He will automatically pull you. When he pulls you, remember him. Meditation without love and devotion no good. Doesn't take very good. Sometimes it's worse than non-meditation because it can give you a false ego. Oh, I meditate for so many hours. I meditate for so long. I've been meditating for years. Oh, I was, I was a follower of that master for so many years. So I'm superior to others. That kind of ego will come in the way of your spiritual progress. But meditate with love and devotion. You make progress.